The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. The trial of one Jeff Britt, campaign consultant operative for Speaker of the House Nick Mattiello back in 2016, all took place last week. Tonight, special guest, needs no introduction, Tim White will roll through this case and this trial with us. It kind of speaks for itself in this wrap-up package from Steph Machado of 12 News. Jeff Britt was already en route to Florida as his bench trial wrapped up this morning, the week-long proceeding giving an inside look at campaigning the voters rarely see. Your Honor, I'm asking the court to find Mr. Britt guilty. Prosecutor Stephen Dambrook making a final argument Friday to Judge Daniel Procassini in the trial of Jeffrey Britt, a former campaign aide to House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, accused of illegally funneling money to pay for a pro Mattiello mailer by Republican Shauna Lyon in the Speaker's close 2016 campaign. Your Honor, the evidence proves that Mr. Britt initiated and fully participated in this scheme. Britt's attorney, Robert Carrenti, did not make a closing argument Friday, but earlier in the trial argued the felony money laundering statute Britt is charged with, carrying 20 years in prison, is overcharged for a case involving $1,000. It's insane. It's just absolutely preposterous. It's dropping an atom bomb on a bug. Over the past week, the trial revealed previously undisclosed details from Mattiello's 2016 campaign, including testimony from the state's star witness, Victor Pachette, who claimed he conducted surveillance on Republican candidate Stephen Frias for the campaign. Pachette is the man to whom prosecutors say Britt paid $1,000 so he could donate it to Lawton to pay for her endorsement mailer. Mattiello himself called to testify Thursday, saying he knew nothing about the mailer until after it hit mailboxes. I was angry with the mailer and I called my chief of staff, Leo Scanyon, and, and yelled at him. Judge Procassini asked the attorneys to submit written final arguments by October 19th. And the judge says after he receives those written arguments, he will likely take four to six weeks to render a decision that, of course, places the verdict likely after the election. Steph Machado, 12 News. And so with Steph's uh, report in the book there, we go to our leading investigative reporter, of course, Tim White, who needs no introduction. Tim, thanks for joining me on the Zoom. Uh, it, was, it was a lot better seeing you in person in the courtroom. Uh, the case aside, it was kind of like the old days when media guys went and kind of did our work and saw real people in a real trial and stenographers and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, the mask being the only difference, Dan, right? Uh, but it felt good. Uh, you and I talked about it. It felt good to be in the courtroom, to be sinking your teeth into a big case and uh, being on TV every night uh, covering that. So it was a lot of fun. It was good seeing you there as well. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. People need to understand when we say fun, we're, we're, we're not reflecting on the case at all. It's just you know, it's what we do, and, it, and, and it's what you do. And I'm going to tell you this, folks. I, 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 you know, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, uh, uh, but I, I tweeted out, I attempted uh, to actually try to chronicle some of the stuff that was going on during the trial day that I was there, but I knew that I had more than a backup. I knew that I had a, a pro. First of all, you type like a demon, and, and your ability to actually be on site and to reflect a play-by-play -play of what's going on, this is where social media is a plus, where, 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 where guys like you can add even more professionalism to your reporting by, by literally blow by blow, not only report what's being said, but give an interpretation of what you're seeing. It was fantastic work, by the way, fantastic. I appreciate it. And I, you know, social media, the pro list and social media is like here and the con list is here. But, um, you know, I cover a lot of federal trials, Dan, and you know this, but for your viewers to understand, cameras are not allowed in courtrooms of, you know, in federal courtrooms. So in many ways, when I'm typing out the, when I'm tweeting out that that's court TV for those situations. So there was a camera allowed inside the Brit trial, which we're going to talk about today, but the judge did not allow us to feed it out. So we couldn't live stream it, which is why I took that approach in there as well. Because people were, you know, there were people interested in the play by play of that trial. Well, tell me, you know, before we get into the nitty gritty of the case, tell me about uh, Judge Procassini. By the way, I've known him for a long time, so have you. I, uh, I, 
I first met him uh, before he was a judge. Uh, I found him to be a uh, an exceptionally congenial and decent guy. Um, I think he's I think he's developed a reputation on the Superior Court for being able to handle um, complicated cases uh, with an even hand. He has a very welcoming um, approach uh, to to everybody who participates. But he's very quirky on the media side thing, don't you think? Why, why, if a camera is allowed in the courtroom, why wouldn't you be able to stream it out and, and give more people access to that court? Well, we'd have to ask Judge Procassini, you know, why he made that decision. But I have experienced that before. And sometimes judges don't like anything that isn't the official record, meaning the stenographer or anything, getting out there in real time. Some judges, Dan, don't even allow They'll let the television camera in there, but they won't allow audio recording of it, which drives me absolutely bananas because you are choking off the public's access to your courtroom. Now, Judge Procassini isn't that way. He's a very transparent judge. Um, he, he understands the role that journalism plays in his courtroom, and he supports it. As a matter of fact, often, well, you saw it, you were there, he would address reporters before we got going that day to say, okay, this is what we're planning for today, and I probably won't issue a decision until such and such a time. That's not very common. I mean, he, he wanted to make sure we understood the process so we could report on it accurately moving forward. So speaking of, of, of the judge's process, uh, interesting that he, to his credit, explained at the beginning of the trial that this be, being a bench trial, meaning the judge will make the decision on guilt or innocence, that he will take what he thinks is his normal four to six weeks to determine an outcome. Uh, maybe perhaps even on the defendant's request for dismissal, which is pro, you know, it's, it, that's pro forma, uh, although I think the arguments are pretty good for dismissal, but uh, we'll talk about that. But um, so he set a tone of anticlimacticness in the, it, it, during the week by saying, by the way, play by play aside, you're not going to get nothing for a while, right? Right. Well, and, you know, whether or not this is part of his decision making or not, what's the big deadline that's looming right now, Dan? It's the elections. And, right. you know, so to us, and I, you know, he's very aware of it. He's a smart guy. He's been, he's been a judge for 20 years, a lawyer before that. Uh, I think he understood that those of us covering the story and those watching at home, uh, would want to know how is he going to issue the decision and is it going to be before November 3rd? And he made it very clear it will not, most likely, not be before uh, November 3rd. So, and, and, that. and that's not, that's not, he's, what he tried to say is this is my format. Right. He was saying this isn't an abnormal decision. I usually take four to six weeks. This is what I normally do. But you pointed out at the beginning of this question, it's a bench trial. This is a, a judge as the fact finder in the courtroom, as opposed to a, you, you know, a jury of 12 being the fact finder. If that were the case, they would deliberate and decide within days. So we'd have a, we'd have a decision pretty quickly. And the flip side, I don't think we would have gone to trial yet. It takes a little bit longer to get to the point of trial than with a bench trial. Yeah. That happens quicker. All right, logistics aside, when we come back, we'll talk with Tim about the actual meat of the case. Uh, Mr. Jeff Britt was the defendant, but um, guess what? There's a whole lot more at stake. We'll be right back with Tim White on this, uh, this trial that regards the Speaker of the House and his staff. Stay with us. And we'll go back to my state of mind. Uh, Tim White is with us. So let's get to the meat of it. One Jeff Britt, uh, a defendant for what is a misdemeanor and a felony count. So the felony count is $1,000 with a money laundering charge. Uh, I'll tell you, Tim, uh, covered a lot of cases, not nearly as many as you in person, but that's a lot of rigmarole for a G-note. Yes? Yeah, you're right. It comes down to one $1,000 transaction in the end uh, with a guy named Victor Pachette. We can get into the details if you want. Now, the state, the attorney general's office, did try to make it about a $2,000 transaction. Remember, there were two $1,000 checks that uh, the state says Jeff Britt coordinated to be paid to Shauna Lawton, um, and they were from two different individuals. One of them, though, they, the state, I would say, failed to establish uh, that Jeff Britt actually funded that $1,000. Uh, the, the, the woman who took the stand there said that was her money. You know, this is Ed Catunio's wife. That was her money that, you know, Jeff, now that he didn't give us the money for that, 
the prosecution tried. In the Pichette case, there is no dispute that Jeff Britt handed uh, Victor Pichette $1,000. Where's the dispute? What was that money for? Right. What the defense tried to raise was he, Jeff Britt owed Victor Pichette money. Once he gave him that money, he can spend it any way he wants. If he wants to donate it to a, a Sean Lawton campaign that already lost in the primary, okay, that's up to him. But that, that's really, as you point out, it comes down a federal, uh, excuse me, a state money launder, laundering charge to a one $1,000 transaction. Yeah, so on the actual, the, the Mr. Pichette, um, you know, through his testimony, I, I think left some gaping holes, one being that he can't account for his accounting. I mean, he can't, he can't figure out where his money was going to what bank where. And although I guess there was a cumulative more than $5,000 that Mr. Britt owed him at the time, uh, look, there's no doubt that, that Jeff Britt put the thumb on, on and that when I say the thumb, you know, asked for, asked for a contribution there. Whatever scheme was in his mind and the, and the campaign's mind to bring on Shauna Lawton, a failed Republican candidate for an endorsement, and the value of that, look, at the end of the day, 85 votes uh, uh, called the election, right? So I guess every vote, every vote counted there. Uh, and that's part of the prosecution's point, that this was instrumental um, in that election. But Mr. Pichette, the guy who wrote the second check, wasn't very good on his accounting. And I'll tell you, when it comes to, uh, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, I just kept thinking, if he can't account for that money being a quid pro quo directly, I don't know how this case sticks. How do you see it? Well, it's interesting. I think it would go differently if there were a jury, uh, because if you can plant that seed of reasonable doubt in one of the 12 jurors, uh, and it, in, in the case of the defense, they were definitely trying to do that with Victor Pichette and really hammer at his credibility. As you point out, you, can, you, don't even, you weren't even keeping track of your money. Um, then, you know, that's, that's a solid approach. I do wonder, though, Dan, if that works with the judge. Again, it's a bench trial. The judge is deciding Britt's fate. Can he see through that and say, look, it, a reasonable jury would find that that $1,000 was meant uh, for the payment for that, that controversial mailer? I don't know. But to your point on the bookkeeping, by the way, there were times, I don't know about you, Dan, sitting in that courtroom, it was easy to forget that Jeff Britt was the one on trial here. Right. And really, it peeled back the curtain on not only the 2016 Mattiello re-election campaign, but the seedy underbelly of campaign politics as a whole. And we learned, I think we know this, but you really saw it front and center. Boy, it's an, it can be an all-cash business sometimes, and that is at the expense of transparency. Yeah, not for nothing. I, I, I thought that Mr. Prichette, key witness, um, you know, ought to keep, uh, keep his uh, voicemail open for messages from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I mean, seriously, I mean, there were some, there were some things that went on in this, in this trial, to your point, where others, I think, have more culpability should authorities decide to pick up on that, including but not limited to um, some of the – team of the Mattiello camp. We'll talk about the speaker's testimony specifically in our next segment, but a guy by the name of Matt Jerzyk um, seemingly contradicted grand jury testimony during the trial, and he actually became uh, almost an impeached witness by the prosecution. It, the, this thing was messy. It was not clean. If, if the Mattiello camp was trying to be able to go, we don't know nothing about Jeff Britt, bang, bang, it's all him. Uh, that, it didn't come out that way. Yeah, and, and certainly I don't think the prosecutors were trying to uh, spare the Mattiello campaign from, you know, if they were getting dinged up as part of their questioning of the different witnesses, you know, they, the state was quick to point out that other people were well aware, you mentioned Matt Jerzyk uh, being one of them, that this, there was coordination going on, Leo Skenyon uh, potentially being another, uh, Mattiello's chief of staff, coordination to get this mailer done with another campaign, which is a violation of, of at, at a minimum, of campaign finance laws. But what they felt they had, the state had for evidence, was that one transaction you and I talked about. And just to go back a little bit on that, you know, you, you quipped that Victor Pachette might get a phone call from the IRS. We should point out in this conversation but that both Victor Pachette and Shauna Lawton were indemnified from prosecution in exchange for their truthful testimony before the grand jury and at trial. Yeah, identified for what happened in the case, not identified for how he handles his money. Uh, so no, no, I get your point. I definitely get your point on that. Yeah, yeah. So when we come back, we'll talk about the Speaker of the House who took the stand 
and uh, he couldn't remember much either. I'll be right back with Tim White on this Jeff Britt trial, students. And welcome back. Tim White joins us as we uh, as we talk about this Jeff Britt trial, the campaign consultant to Speaker Mattiello, who back in 2016 organized a uh, an endorsement and and is alleged to have funneled money to the endorsers campaign for a mailer that went into the district to uh, to make the argument that Speaker Mattiello was a good choice. Remember Steve Frias, the Republican who beat that uh, that candidate, Shauna Lawton, uh, went down to the wire, actually won at the ballot box, but got nipped at the mail ballots um, uh, in that particular race and, you know, almost took the next one in 2018. Uh, this time around, it's the mayor's wife uh, who is uh, coming after the speaker, and she's got a lot of ammunition. What was your take on the speaker's testimony, Tim? Well, first, I just wanted I, it was, I took a, a step back during that testimony, Dan, and I'm sitting in the courtroom 15 feet away from Speaker Mattiello, and it dawned on me, a sitting speaker of the Rhode Island House is testifying in a criminal trial over a mailer that was $2,100 back in 2016. And it was, it, it's very rare to have a sitting House Speaker testify at a criminal trial alone. And just it being over such a common thing in a district level race, a, a campaign flyer, a mailer, it was pretty, pretty astounding. But look, it was clear that uh, the House Speaker, his current Chief of Staff, Leo Skenyon, and Matt Jerzyk, who is his former uh, you know, deputy counsel and campaign aide, uh, they had a lot of trouble remembering what happened leading up to the final weeks and uh, in that, that mailer in, in 2016. There was a lot of, I don't recall, a lot of, I don't remember throughout that questioning. And you could see primarily prosecutors, because remember, they were defense witnesses, prosecutors getting very frustrated with the witnesses for their lack of memory. Yeah, look, the Speaker of the House uh, um, had, had, a, had, there were a few scenarios where he was asked specifically, and his opening, the opening saga, if you will, where the defense attorney, Bob Carrenti, you know, peppered him about his relationship with Jeff Britt, uh, Britt's role in that, in that 2016 campaign, uh, an event at the Takeo Incorporator where uh, my friend John White, your friend, he's a, he's a wonderful guy, philanthropist in, in town, um, uh, Takeo is a very well-known company, I and mean, John opens his doors at Takeo for, uh, and you know, disclosure, he 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 uh, sponsors this show. Uh, so, but that wouldn't guide my thought process here. I'm telling you, but I'm just telling you that I remember that event, uh, and I know that Jeff Britt organized it with Mr. White, and I know that uh, I know that the speaker. Uh, uh, met Mr. White through Mr. Britt, something he denied under under oath, saying that his relationship with Mr. White was organic, my words, um, and and I know that's not true. Uh, so, I mean, there there are things that I just, I was like this in the trial going, oh man, this is the beginning of what is, I don't know, I can't remember. I think the court of public opinion is going to be more damaging for the speaker than, than the court, uh, the criminal court. Uh, in fact, you're watching the show on Wednesday, folks, but yesterday I played at length the speaker's testimony. Uh, I, I want people to hear how the speaker handled this whole thing um, and let them make a judgment for themselves. Uh, you agree? I, the, 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 I, I, do, I do agree with that. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with that. Sorry, Dan. I mean, like, let, let's face it. I was live outside Kent County Courthouse all week last week and, you know, uh, five, six o'clock, four o'clock news is a video of the House Speaker raising his right hand and, and swearing to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if you're only getting a sort of a passing glimpse at the trial, you might not be sure exactly what the dynamics are, but all you see is the House Speaker on the witness stand. And that's not, that's not a, a great look, I think, for, for the campaign. And of course, Channel 10 was there and the Providence Journal and the Boston Globe, you were there. So it got a lot of coverage leading up into the final weeks of of his campaign. And I think some of the frustration for people, and I'm sensing it from you as well with the, the not remembering is, we have to remember, even though he's a House Speaker, this is a district race. This is District 15 in Cranston. Um, and yeah, there gets a little bit more, a lot more scrutiny because he is House Speaker, but um, it's not like there are so many levels to his campaign organization that he would be insulated from decisions down here. I think it's fair to question whether or not 
he was more involved with his campaign than, than he let on on the And scene. he's reputed to be a micromanager. So, uh, and these guys all testified, nothing, nothing gets spent. No, 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 everything that requires money is something that he would be involved with. Now, he would say, well, I didn't write the checks for that particular uh, mailer. So, you know, why would I know? But the idea that he found out about it by a constituent or, or either through the mail or by a constituent showing him the mail. Uh, well, look, you know what? Uh, I have a little bit more leeway here. I, there's a bridge I'd like to sell you over, over that kind of thing. We'll see whether or not it meets out. I only have a minute here, Tim. What do you, what do you think, um, uh, what's your read on, on this trial's impact on the election, number one? Oh, I, I don't, I'm not going to predict that. I don't know. I think it has an impact. How much, we can't, we don't know because voting is so bizarre this year that it's really hard to tell. Yeah, and uh, we don't predict outcomes from judges, but the, the interesting part is there's a lot of technical language issues involved in this whole thing that very well may be anticlimactic components of a decision which could let the defendant off. Yeah, real quick, because you're running out of time. The judge is struggling mightily with a money laundering statute, the felony that you talked about that Jeff Britt is charged with. He talked about how it's not well written um, and it's unclear. You know, I think there are questions about what the elements are of that statute. So anyway, all of that is there are a lot of like legal questions about the case. Forget about the evidence for a minute, which you and I spent a lot of time on. I think there are a lot of legal questions about the case, which is what the motion to dismiss is all about. And I'll be very interested to see how Judge Procassini comes around on that, because this is the first money laundering trial the state has ever had, if you can believe it. Wow. All right, uh, Tim, it's always uh, great to grab your expertise. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, and when this thing comes down, we'll talk to you prior before that, too. Tim White, uh, final word when we come back. Stay with us. So the judge's verdict on Jeff Britt will come probably within a month or so. The first verdict that we're probably concerned with as well is the verdict of the people in District 15 and whether or not they re-elect Speaker Nick Mattiello. Lots going on here, Washington, and beyond. We'll talk to you tomorrow night and on the radio, weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRL. Good night.